Well, it's an interesting time. First of the year, uh, yep. 2020. This is a big year. We've got a lot of hopes, a lot the of expectations. The first year that my vision and the year coincide. You know what I'm saying? Okay, you and your 2020 vision. Well, uh, yeah. good for you, my friend. All right, uh, not to mention those glasses that we're seeing you <laughs> They're wear. They're off the show. I, I'm trying to, you know, I wear the glasses because I'm trying to get respect. I think if I wear the glasses, people will, like, look at me. That that guy might be smart. And as long as I don't open my mouth, right. it's okay. Yeah, well, opening your mouth seems like it got us in a lot of trouble in the past. So uh, why, we'll hope that uh, that's why he's calling the we'll FBI. Get through, we'll get through today, but uh, good to have the hack, as you call him, in the studio. <laughs> the hack. I'm not sure that's a complimentary <laughs> kind of comment, but uh, all right. So what's going on? What's uh, what's happening with you, we, my friend? Here's what I thought we'd talk about because it's the first of the year. Yeah, and this is the time of the year people make. Um, Resolutions, right? New Year's resolution. Got There's it. a couple to think about that because you know some folks would say that that's not a good idea. Oh, really? Right. That that. Well, it, it's a little like dieting. It's the um, no one does these things, right? They say it, they don't do it. Is that the problem? Well, here's the thing. It's like if you think about it, like it 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 sets up like uh, what makes dieting a problem is as opposed to changing your life, you simply restrict and punish yourself around a certain thing called food, and it doesn't last. So it's it's right. it is no. um so it's a bit saying like frivolous. And uh, on um look, if I look at my calendar and I've got it's um, November, look, I'm going to keep doing the things I'm doing but come January I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to re- is my resolution I'm going to stop. Right? Right. Like uh, my wife, she does a lot of smokeless tobacco, dips a lot. Oh. And uh <laughs> didn't know that about. You sure? <laughs> I'm not well, saying, well don't, don't 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 tell it. Sound right. <laughs> but he, she keeps don't saying. Believe everything you hear. Maybe I don't know. She keeps saying that you know I'm tired of uh, I'm tired of find, finding pink spit cups laying around the house. It's disgusting. But um, something uh, something just happened over no, there. No, all there's uh, <laughs> something is always happening, my friend. You may not be aware of it, but it is always happening it's, around it's, here. So. So, but, uh, don't but, be too worried. It's all it's all okay. We got Doctor Hackett here. In case things I, I think I told you this early that my uh, my son saw one of uh, the podcasts and said that the studio looks like a crack den. Well, so, but you, don't, <laughs> you tell your son to come in the studio. But here's the thing: he makes how does he know what looks like a crack den? I that's, really should have now asked. Now that is a good that's, question, that's, and that's we need to get issue. back to that. Uh, <laughs> <You know. laughs> but I did say to him, I said, "Look, if you're going to go to crack dens, I just want to make sure you go to quality. Anything you do, you be the best at it." So, <laughs> you good know. advice. But so. Not not necessarily in that case. Yeah. All right. So, all right. Where, where were we? We're saying that resolutions. People make them. They they don't. They don't well, continue. We it, just do it, that. It may set up for some reason some uh, counterproductive um, parameters in one's life. Uh, okay. If nothing else, uh, with the example of my wife, if you say to you, if you keep pushing off the thing that you're wanting to change, kicking the can down the road, that of itself is problematic. Right, but also because you you and it, we, we talk about some mental health stuff here. We talk about some, sure we do. We even talk about some psychoanalytic stuff every once in a yeah, while. Absolutely. So the idea is that all behavior exists in a context. So right the, it, with my wife's smokeless tobacco habit. Wrong. Keep the, going. <laughs> the goal would be not necessarily that she should stop doing that. Okay. But maybe she would stop whatever is going on or address whatever is going on that makes her need that. Okay. It's a very, okay. There's a, a different switch, you know? Get to, get to the cause of things, yeah. Right. yeah. So as opposed, because there, uh, there used to be a thing we talk about in the literature a lot called symptom substitution, that if you uh, removed one, sim- if you just targeted the symptom and removed it, something else something is going to show up. Yeah, is that still a thing now? Do we still talk well, about that in uh research doesn't narrate, you know, because it was often used as a way to uh, disparage behavior therapy and behavioral therapies. Oh, um, that's right. The fight uh, between psychoanalytic and behavior therapies. Right. Uh, actually, a book. Wachtell wrote that book. That was a great book to read. But, uh, I have, I have met and hung out with Wachtell. Yeah. I have, yeah. But um, he was a guy who thought that they could be, um, they could be merged. Wrong, <laughs> evidently. <laughs> well, well, but um, <laughs> well, maybe so. I mean, I, I not long uh, this morning, as a matter of fact, I told a story about a uh, a uh, a therapy in a, in a therapy situation with a couple who were very intellectual and gained a lot of insight and looked at things, but it was only the behavioral method that seemed to make a difference with them. So, mm-hmm. some kind of joining between those two things, maybe not a bad way to go. Well. What, Sorry. What 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 may be helpful? It's interesting because you know people don't realize that um, the average number of sessions Freud saw someone was four, 
and that um, we know we have at least several of his cases where at the time he used direct behavioral intervention. So no, the real world Got looks it. nothing like um, a book that someone wrote to right. prop up a theoretical model. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> All right, let's, uh, uh, yeah, we need to cut that out. That needs to be a it's, clip uh, yeah. right there. So, uh, 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 we all know that. We learned the hard way. In fact, I, I imagine anybody who comes from a strict theoretical model, the minute they hit the real world, is like, okay, this is not the way. This is, Regardless you, of what the model is. I want to go back and say, <laughs> you didn't teach me what, what was, we need to know. There's some things that, missing there. That, that's, very, that's, that's, good. that's knowledge, by the way, but maybe they should. Maybe they should zero in on how these things work together. But Well, I remember my um, one of my mentors, he was a pretty famous psychoanalyst, and um, he... Um, uh, I, he was in supervision with him, and he came from. Oh, it was an old school psychoanalyst, and so he was, you know, the sort of the very quiet, never said anything. Uh, he sort of right. emphasized. I think he told us that we should um, we should always wear drab clothing, not have pictures of our family on our in our, uh, you know, and we're allowed to have books, but be careful what books. So there's this whole light, you know. Right. And, he, and okay. uh, he was okay. very, very highly interpreted, very gifted in terms of his ability to be able to interpret things. And um, he would do a thing where um, we would play five minutes of a session, and he would stop it. And he'd say, okay, this is this person's issues, but this is also your issues. And you're going to collide with him in this way, and this is how the session's going to unfold. Okay. It was inevitably correct. Right. Okay. I like <laughs> just this guy. The, just with five minutes of information, he would sort of... But, <laughs> but he sort of protected this image, and one time he was in his office, and he got a call, and he picked it up, and he got, and he... He said, you know, uh, I hear him talking to his uh, his patient. He goes, man, that sounds horrible. Oh, I'm so sorry. You've been working so hard. Well, you know, you know, you know I, I know you're not, I know right now you, you don't feel it, but, you know, I love you, and there are people that love you, and, and you know, get, we're going to get through this together. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's talking <laughs> to the guy, and he hangs the phone up, and I say, who's that? He goes, one of my patients. And I was like, one of your patients. Wait, <laughs> what do you, what, what that's, happened? That's nothing like what you told. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Where's the hard co interpretations <laughs> in there? There's different things. That, that was you a know, lot of empathy going on there. And then I was like, okay, now I think I realize how this works. <laughs> ah, well, I have a question for you, a little off the topic, but you have been teaching uh, at the university, and you, you call it that. I, I know <laughs> that. Uh, careful that uh, the. Uh, could go different ways there but but you've taught a course in theory and counseling mm-hmm. theory and there are a number of theories in those books and they probably clash just a little bit and i know your psychoanalytic uh, orientation so mm-hmm. how is that for you to teach all of these very mm-hmm. different theories well, i'm it, just curious it works at this and I, this is actually how i walk through life period okay i am um, i i just find things that will fuel and feed my sense of superiority that's really all i do that's it that's it right there every (laughs) any situation it's all about you some reason so you know well at least i'm not well it is interesting because (laughs) because but i i I can see i can see you saying okay listen i'm going to teach you this theory but don't listen to a word that they listen to what i have to say over here that's what i'm thinking happens i'm not sure i would sneer a lot (laughs) there's a lot of sneering yeah yeah this guy they call it (laughs) But uh, it was interesting because um, the textbook we we used in places, not uniformly, because sometimes the chapters were co-written or written by people who actually espoused that theoretical model, but the book itself was so poorly written and conceived (laughs) that I often felt sorry for the theory. (laughs) I'm like, come on, man. I would often find myself, you know, I really think it's better (laughs) <laughs> what they're putting out here. I'm just hiding. Yeah, I, I remember back at the time when he said, you know, we need to rip this chapter out of this book. Uh, like, well, the that. one on psychoanalysis looked like it was written in 1923. Oh, yeah, that's I mean, true. If you, if you dug up Freud, that. he'd be going, well, hold on a second, man. This, who, is who a little, this? this is a little stale. What are you talking about here? A little Victorian. But, it's, uh, like, what the, come on. But it makes sense. The guy who wrote the book is like 150, so probably it's yeah, not, it's, yeah. it's not a... But you can tell that as the the book had, you know, there have been like 23 editions of this. I don't know. Oh, yeah. That's how, that's how it's money is well, made in the book industry. Then. They had, you could tell that they the, the later chapters had had changed to meet the times. But that first chapter, which is the psychoanalytic one, I bet it had, I, I would like no to go wants. back to the 23rd and like, no, that really No one wants changed. to touch that chapter. That's no, what that is, right? Changed. Nothing's changed <laughs> so, in this. Yeah. But, right. so, but right. it, it is interesting because... 
there are moments when you are challenged in a way by another theoretical model. Right. But I think that um, I think I've been mugged by the real world enough. Right. <laughs> to where to where <laughs> beaten down. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> any sense of certainty or smugness has long since beaten out of me by the real world. <laughs> so when I read them, I'm like, you know, that might work. Uh, it's not, you know. It's or that. sometimes I would say, you know, the way they made that sound, I wish that were true, but I don't think that's really going to happen. That's gonna, not going to happen. I don't, maybe that sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sorry. If it were only were so. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, it's these real world experiences that help ground you a little bit there and uh, puts, uh, take away the joy <laughs> maybe even some ways. But, but uh, uh, I think uh, you're. I think you're still okay, uh, even though it's happened like that. So I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take us well, off uh, topic, well, but I want to make it, sure it, I hit it that may note be, there. This may or may not be connected to the topic either, but you know, it's it's interesting because there are different worlds of therapy, and I come from a clinical psychological perspective, which is a very medical model, and um, the book is very much from a counseling perspective. Sure. So there's already sort of a, a different. Right. philosophical grounding and substrate you know the foundations are slightly different right and that makes and so i think particularly since cycling theory early on was so wedded with the medical model and with um uh, psychiatry and whatnot it really didn't make the transition that some of the other theories did to be used within that counseling framework so uh, I often, like right. we, we're a lot of folks from Auburn's Counseling Center or the Counseling Education Program at Auburn will come over and intern. And um, they'll always inevitably say to me, this is, this is not what I thought psychoanalytic theory was. <laughs> what is, well, this is not, you know, I'm like, yeah. well, you know, it, it actually might be. It's just, <laughs> the, the, you know, you haven't. So they often haven't really been exposed to it in a way that, you know, that would, um, that would make them maybe think about it in any other way than oh my god i'm glad they don't do that anymore you know right like, like, right right yeah so yeah um, there's so there's so many things about it you know uh on the couch uh the therapist doesn't look at you there's no contact they remain quiet the whole psychoanalytic notion where you're free thought free thinking uh dreamed interpretation all of those kinds of things well there's more to it evidently and uh well, freud he, regularly he made tea psychology. for all of his patients winnicott gave everybody cookies Okay. Before and I'll after. I'll go to session. that therapist. <laughs> I, like I mean, it. there really was, you know, I think uh, I think part of the, the model of this sort of um, completely uh, um, distant and disconnected therapist, uh, mm -hmm. Freud made this statement that you should be like a mirror. You should re reflect back. You should be like a surgeon in some ways. But all of this came from the fact that he noticed that therapists begin sleeping with their patients. Mm -hmm. And that, uh -oh. I think Trouble. he was, Jung actually sort of stirred that because I think Jung had, you know, sex with about 42 of his patients or something like that. At least three. But, um, okay. Yeah. So um, I think part of that comes from an attempt to be able to not become entangled in certain ways. And I think it's also fueled by right. some Victorian stuff. Freud was never about psychoanalytic theory being done by psychiatrists. His goal was it was going to be given for free in clinics by housewives uh, because he thought women were naturally more um, intuitive and emotionally connected, and a lot of the housewives had time on their hands, and they would be good at it, and so he had this vision Okay. That was well. Now I don't think I've ever I've, yeah. I've come across that idea. So that I, was, I, I appreciate you sharing that. That didn't work out, evidently. But well, um, there was these thing called the Nazis. Okay. <laughs> they kind of they screwed a lot of things up. Oh, that's right. Telling that's right. You they about that time. Okay. There's a famous yeah. saying by Freud because you know he stayed up until into into um, uh, Austria up until um, I mean almost to to to. Things got horrible. I think he left in 38, 39. I think that's when he, isn't it? Or that's when he died. No, I think he, uh, I, he, he, he died a couple years after he left anyway. But um, they were, you know, there were all these rumors of what was happening. And, and he said that, um, he said, no, civilization is advanced. They're burning my books. They're not burning me. Okay. And, Let's you look know. Look at the positive there. But right. what was 
for, you know what what he wasn't noticing is at some point they were going to start burning him. He would literally have yeah, been burnt. That's it. And when his daughter Anna had been roughed up at a police station over um, her um, her being a Jewish and whatever, and she came home and told him, that's when he said we're leaving. And okay, then they were, were out of here. The British, some British ambassadors. Um, um, helped pull him out and bring him into to Britain. So, okay. but most of his family were killed. I think in Auschwitz and um, mm-hmm. his sisters, his extended family. There was a huge number of people around him who were wow. So, so uh, there were a lot of things that he would kind of put into play and maybe work. Uh, some of the things that we see now may be very different had it not been for the Nazis. And you know, the they war. screwed up a lot of things. Yeah, they did evidently. That, That's why they call it a world war, yeah, by the way. If I remember that right. Hitler's haircut and mustache—you can't get those anymore without without. Yeah, but we'll say Pete Rose somehow managed to to hold on, and not the mustache. <laughs> you couldn't combine the two. Pete but, Rose, there's a reference. You is, boomers out there. Against, there are, okay. uh, so, yeah, I know you're looking at you're looking at Dr. Haggard. He's not. He's said he's not going to respond. He's so, so far he hasn't. Yeah, I know, but he's had plenty to say. Well, it's giving it to himself. What is it we could say that might 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 goad him on? Like, is there some oh, listen, sort of topic? I, that... I'm, I, d- listen, I'm sure you're going to come up with something. He's going to grab the mic. He's going to. It's going to be. A... He's going to cancel your mic, and then he's going to talk and s- try to clarify some things here, but. In the meantime, all right, we got off topic just a little bit there, my friend. But uh, so we're talking about this, uh, these resolutions, these ideas for the new year. You're going to do it, but really, you're not. So well, think about it like a, like a, if if somebody were to talk to me about wanting to change any any sort of habit, um, right. it isn't that we. Even if you are very symptom focused, if you come from a pretty strict behavioral uh, uh, therapy orientation. You still want to be able to contextualize the thing that's going on. Sure. So if someone comes in, you know, like if someone came to me and they said, uh, um, well, throw my wife under the bus, pretend like she has a smokeless tobacco habit. Let's yeah, I know. We've gone there. We've, it's well, too late well, well, now. We'll She's in that. trouble. Well, hold on to that. No, wait. You're in trouble as soon as he finds out. All right, go back. She's not going to watch it. She puts up with me enough. Why yeah, she, yeah. Why would she want to why was she? search for videos of you? She's like, literally. She's got the... It's not, uh, Oh my goodness! Um, um, she wants. She's gonna be looking at pictures of Antonio Banderas or something. I don't know. Something. I don't know. <laughs> but um, um, there's a. Um, uh, if someone said, "Okay, this is something I, I wanted to to try to get to to deal with," and you begin talking to them about it, and they tried to implement some strategies to be able to remove this from their life, but they, these things didn't work. At least at that point, you begin to expand the context. Okay. You begin to think about maybe in terms of secondary gain. But I always think, and this goes for any sort of resolution that someone makes, because that's what we're talking about, the idea that suddenly you're going to be doing something different with your life. You're yeah. going to be, you know, whatever. I right, always and you've got to take the steps and the actions to make something happen with that, too, as well. I think with any behavior you want to you want to change, the first question you should ask yourself is, what itch does it scratch? What purpose does it serve? We would say in uh, psychology therapy, or in theory, that, um, you know, uh, what is its place in my psychic economy? Okay. And or my libidinal economy. Either either way. Okay. And so it has a place. It, it does something. And so, for instance, often if you talk to someone about the possibility of of changing their uh, their habits in in, in uh, eating habits, for instance. Sure. Often, what fuels compulsive behavior, period, particularly eating is that there's often underlying affect states that have yet to be sort of processed or named. Mm -hmm. So if you are feeling bad about the way you look, and it is food that you blame for this thing, you begin to circle around food in this sort of spiral of of shame, and and, uh, you are connected to it in a way, and food becomes a thing that you can focus on. And it also becomes a temporary cure when you are, uh, you know, Eating a uh, um, some uh, uh, funyuns when you're uh, when you're eating. I was some wondering where you were going because I, I was thinking anybody hearing that pause <laughs> when you're thinking about eating or you're thinking about food and then there are pictures that just start to pop well, up with everyone. So I'm just uh, well, I was trying to think. Uh, of the, I was, uh, what's the most, funyuns is the, what came to you, by the way. Well, what food is most likely to give a party in the mouth? What is it? Funyuns. Funyuns, that is. You think 
You think Funyuns? <laughs> I like that. I like that. No, I, I was just I, I was going with you because I thought maybe. Which, as an aside, <laughs> a party in your mouth. Okay. I, I had a girlfriend I dated who smelled like Funyuns. That's what I'm saying. Oh, she had well, there's this, a problem right there. I don't know. I think uh, unless a you're nice a Funyun smell. lover, oh, in more ways than one. <laughs> yeah, Boom. Was, okay, there you go. That was. It was. All I gotta she say put the that. fun in Funyuns. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, oh, more of your old girlfriends coming through and saying <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah. thing. But, All right, uh, so where were you going? You were asking the question. So, so, but the mere act of eating this thing right. is temporary relief for the very suffering that it has caused. And that traps you in this sort of loop. Right. Right? And so people begin to restic- restrict and diet. And it literally can, in, it can invest food with even more of a potential to pull you and draw oh, you. Does that okay. make sense? Okay. Yeah, you literally yeah. find yourself. So the goal often is to be able to deal with some of the underlying emotions, to be able to think to yourself, what itch does it scratch? What is it? I mean, um, uh, I, I, uh, I'll often have folks come in and they, they have some concern with weight or whatever it may be. And, and uh, they often haven't considered that there are some really unhappy, skinny people. Right. And yes. you're... Um, your weight may have little or nothing to do with your general sense of, of happiness or... So, so people glom on to the simple fix in these things. It may have nothing to do with that, but it seems like something, so we'll go in that until well, even, I mean, look it at the doesn't happen anymore. Suggest that once your income starts rising above $75,000 a year, oh, yeah. the, um, the difference between somebody who makes $75,000 a year and $500,000 a year in terms of how it contributes to happiness is very is diminished. I'd like to try that experiment. I've you give me the five hundred thousand, and well, we'll, I don't know what. Yeah, I don't know how be, that's uh, going to work. Let's just say uh, <laughs> no. But that uh, idea that money's not good. Yeah. So and and people who who may uh, feel that uh, they're going to lose weight and their life is suddenly going to be rosy and everything's going to be wonderful. So doesn't work like that well and i mean it, it butts up against this this whole notion of happiness i think we talked about before and that in of itself is problematic because um you know i think you called it the happy in- industry yeah, or? yeah the yeah uh, badu calls it the happiness I- uh, industrial complex <laughs> okay and that there's this these this bevy of of corporations and governments that are all wanting us to fall for this notion that somehow we should be happy all the time <laughs> and, then part of, and then you know it's embedded in American culture that there's this you know the idea that um, it's in our commercials and in the, the everything that we see and we're bombarded by that somehow this is the goal is to be happy, right? And and the problem is no, I'm just well, kidding, but <laughs> basically, yeah. Well, the, so I'm I'm in that complex somehow. Well, the the problem often is is that um, like it or not, there are lots of crayons in the crayon box. Oh. And your capacity to be able to color with as many of them as possible probably is more indicative of your capacity to have a balanced and well-lived life. Okay. Some of us may be lucky enough. I mean, there's even the story of the Buddha where his family tried to um, keep him completely free of any suffering. So he never left the palace, had everything he wanted, you know, and whatnot. Right. So that there's even in the, 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 the myth or the, the, the story, the fable. Kind of like a parenting style a little bit there for some. But they yeah, gave him same. everything. Right. But still, suffering found a way to, to, to find him, you know, and I, yeah. I, I think, um, and the goal would be, how does one become better and better equipped to deal with the natural emotional contingencies that come with just life? And as okay. uh, you, you may know this, the feelings that you have when you're 18 can be different than the feelings you have when you're 50. Mm-hmm. And so it is an ever-changing landscape. And so it's never something we can completely solve because there's always something shifting, uh, both uh, broadly and narrowly. And so our goal is, how do we find a way to be able to live with the things that we're continually given? And a big chunk of that is, is some degree of suffering. And nothing could make you suffer more if you think you're supposed to be living the life you see in a truck commercial. Right. Well, I, I I was almost thinking of just about any commercial these days. When it's medicine, you have a terrible medical problem, but people are sort of bounding through the mm-hmm. wheat field with the right. sun and shining if, and everybody's if, happy and all the if models. That's your are, idea of what life would be. <laughs> you are going to be 
at best frustrated by what you're going to receive, at worst devastated by the fact that it may be like that. It in didn't certain, fix it. <laughs> and, and it may be like that at moments. There are moments of pure joy and exultation that come from just, you know, there are. They're there. Let's 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 go but, with a couple of those. How about that? Well, they, they I think it involved drugs. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, the marketing <laughs> problem. I think we're coming up against it. That it's been painted at uh, almost anything you're trying to sell on the television or any media platform. Uh, it's got all these wonderful, happy th- moments mm-hmm. and people smiling and talking, and everything is happy in that in that regard and you can sell more products so we may be just victims mm-hmm. of this commercialism and uh as you you've talked about earlier uh, well how we may be victimized in a way is it may keep us further from the sort of skills and investment in our life that may be necessary for our for us to be to have some level of of at least temporary contentment and to grow I uh, before I was going to bed last night. I was reading a Roger Scruton. Anybody here, a Roger Scruton fan? Uh, no, sorry. He was probably the foremost conservative thinker, certainly in philosophy and um, and uh, in a number of things. And uh, uh, as you know, I'm a commie lefty. But I uh, I've long ago and made we still let you in the studio. Yeah, so good, yeah. Okay. But long ago, I said to myself, I can only be a comedy uh, – comedy. That's, that's, that's a – That was a good <laughs> – That's a Freudian slip. <laughs> there we go. I could only be a commie lefty if I – at least 10% of the books I read had to be completely opposite of what I believe. Okay. And quickly, I found that some of those made me want to jump out a window. But I found people like Scruton and folks like that who I may disagree with them, but they can articulate and they can challenge me to think in some ways. And so I've, I've read a good bit of Scruton. Oh, my and, friend. Uh, that is uh... – <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm glad you had that balance though there, but you know there are people who have never heard the opposite of their beliefs. They never heard any contradictions to, uh, or other the other side, and it seems to be in this. Uh, well, Dr. Hackett and I talked about earlier this this notion of this uh, have and have nots and the differences and the political differences and the siding. Well, they talk about the, the, the bubbles that we live in, right? Like, uh, those of us who were sort of not or were mugged by Trump's election. We were living in a liberal bubble. I was in a Facebook, and it was there was literally. I remember, right before the uh, the uh, uh, results of the election, I went to bed, and I was like, "Man, we got this." And so I woke up in the morning, and I woke my wife up because I get up before in the morning. She heard me scream. I was like, "No!" Screaming. All right, I love it. <laughs> you know, it was like a Twilight Zone episode. The world I I le- I had woke up in a new world. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, but if, if I had been, oh, you got Dr. Hackett laughing over there. So there we go. But if <laughs> I, if if my Facebook friends should have been there, had, if if my wor- my if my social media world had been a little broader, I might have seen some of these things seen potentially some of that coming. coming. But Those I didn't who see. predicted it, but right. you know, That's it's not. Nice. Uh, uh, but um, Scruton is is a guy who um, he he, um, he he does provide a little a little balance. But he was talking. Um, I'm not sure what my point for Scruton was. Oh, I, I, he was talking a little right. bit about um, about the role of art and culture. Yes. Scruton is uh, very much uh, into, um, in fact, the, the title of the book, I think, is called Modern Culture. And being a conservative, he's not a big fan of modern culture by any means, and uh, particularly popular culture. Um, and there's a video of him, because he's also, um, he he's, knows a lot about music. There's a video of him going over a uh, Metallica song on a lecture. <laughs> it's really funny, okay. and you can, it's it's obvious that he has nothing but contempt for not only the music but anyone who might engage in it. But he's also very bright and attempting to grapple with it in a way that can convey that to his audience without losing them. So right. it's really interesting to see. Cause yeah, that's hard to do. I mean, you know, yeah. here here's a oh by the way, I'm going to tell you a bunch of things you don't like and you won't want to hear. But he's, and, he's uh, going on about it. You're going to uh, uh, be okay at the end of it. That's a hard act to, to pull off. Yeah, one of the things sure. that I like that he said is that the difference between what he calls uh, popular or low culture and high culture, and there's already, you know, Right there. <laughs> right know, there. But it's interesting in the book because I'm reading the forward to it, and he said, uh, how did he put it? He said, um, he said, I realize um, as I write this, this notion of high and low culture is um, fraught with uh, concern and is is sure to uh, upset many a reader. Um, and then he stops and he says something like, but 
that's what something something degree but that's what you're going to get in the 300 pages to follow so he says <laughs> you know it's so, going to happen okay <laughs> you know if you're going to keep going this is what you're going to get but one of the things that i think he does touch on i was as i was down in my music room this morning listening okay. to some autecker all right and i think that we talked about this before they released an album i think it's eight hours long last year and the year before that or two years before they released an album that was four hours long mm -hmm. um that, that was a single <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> a joke. Uh, next song <laughs> okay yeah, so there we go. but uh and as i'm listening to him i'm realizing okay so this doesn't meet his criteria because for him popular culture provides um a distraction it provides a way for us to be um to play Right. Um, it, 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 it may give us all sorts of um, uh, things, but what it doesn't is it doesn't challenge us, us in a way and grow our ability to deal with our feelings and the complexities of life. So for him, art, okay. in a way, can be both instructive and impactful in that high culture can do this mm -hmm. and that low culture can't. Okay. And that, you know, like... Um, um, no one, we, if someone listens to Beethoven, um, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, for instance, we can, if, if they have an understanding of musical structure, they can see how he can take a motif and he can stretch it and pull it and, and bind it and do all these things with it in a way that is remarkable. They can also read into it um, the image of Beethoven pounding on the gates of heaven bum 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 you know and that it each that there is something you can see the uh, the full force of his spirit unfold and the challenges against its unfolding and you can so there are lots of ways to read something into that music whether it's at its structural level compositional level or philosophical or generating some sort of programmatic narrative there are all sorts of ways to play with that in a way that could grow you whereas little dicky not so much you know. Okay. Or um, Lil Xan. If you're a big Lil Xan fan, anybody? I'm, I'm anybody? not Lil Xan uh, fan. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Bueller? Uh, no, <laughs> not, evidently not in this in this situation. So, and, and when we talk about this notion of resolution, we talk about this notion of changing. Scruton would have said, I think, that our goal is to find things that grow us to grapple more and more with the complexities that we've, we're faced with as an individual and as a culture. As a conservative thinker, he would say that there's a wealth of things we already know that we should pull from. Mm -hmm. If a very conservative individual may say that we already have enough, and why be distracted by something new? You know, I guess that would be sort of maybe a, an ultra-conservative way of thinking about things. Right. But he, um, um, but if the idea of this is a real stretch, but um, simply changing a behavior is a little like um, listening to lots of little Zan from Scruton's perspective. That okay. it requires contextual and characterological structure and growth. That's what's asked of us if we truly want to generate some sort of resolution that's worth worth the, its weight. So we we've really got to find some ways to uh, look at the underlying issues that are that are prompting that resolution for the new year and because i think everybody almost i would say across the board know that resolutions run out about february or maybe march in in most cases or even before that in some some ways you make them so it's a talking point but then then again really uh well, wouldn't you have done that in have, the, have you ever had a resolution you, what resolution you've had one well what what, what what's it been uh dr hackett what, what's your resolution? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Talk I'm gonna. Less, listen more. <laughs> he's done that. Look, he. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, he's that putting a, that into play right now. Yes. As a matter of fact, yes. because he just finished an yes. hour long conversation, and now he's but quiet and listening. I think he should work okay. on scowling less, because occasionally I look over there. <laughs> there is a. <laughs> so, well, we, we're all we're not on camera. You would see some of mine too, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Well, yeah, I, I, that's kind of the 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 notion that we we go through. Um, um, an exercise, but it really, yeah, we want to lose weight or we want to do whatever these things are, 
but wait a minute, it takes a lot of work, it takes well, a lot of insight, it takes a lot of effort. Oh, come on. Well, what if your overall resolution was, I'm going to take a step back at the year that has just unfolded behind me, and I can think, is, is there a pattern of the challenges that I've faced? Are there been lows and highs, and what might I learn from them? And how can I think about the year to come based on where I've been? How can you be informed by and take that information and, and to be able to make use of it is something that, for the thing that's flowing towards you. There is the, the possibility of true growth in that, I think, both okay. from, an ind from a particular and a universal. Uh, the more of us that do that, the more things could change in general in a better way, right? All right. I, yeah. I think our current political climate would suggest that there, and, and we talked about this before. I'm not sure if there's really any more of a division than there ever has been because political divisions and divisions yeah. have been ubiquitous. So to go back in history, you can yeah, see sure that people always, were dueling and shooting each yeah, other. So, but, yeah, uh, that, yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you know. Okay. I, I wouldn't shoot someone in a MAGA hat. I think about it. But I wouldn't shoot someone in a MAGA hat. But, um, I'll edit that out later. Yes, All right, sorry. there we go. That was a joke. It was a joke. But uh, – um, that in of itself could spark, like, and just in a, you know, like, if your resolution, may, may, maybe this is a behavioral re resolution, then I'm going to make it a point to, if I see someone in a MAGA hat, to ask them in a in a caring way, there's something important to you about the hat that you have on. Mm -hmm. There is something about that that is important to you. Please share with me what that is. Not okay. in a way that is like, you know, sarcastic or mean, but it's obvious. There's something, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and Scruton would say that often that our, um, that um, uh, he quotes Heidegger, I think, that often the hats or T-shirts we wear with things on them are a being for others. They're an act of display mm -hmm. to show fidelity to a group. Right. They um, And for him, um, that's in some ways an act of cowardice because it is it is not the development of the individual. It's a fleeing into the group. Right. And uh, he thinks that popular culture especially is can uh, can be prey to that, that we often like the things our friends like and we look to see what's popular so we can fit in. We don't necessarily embrace things that somehow can grow us outside of that. Right. And... Um, so, uh, and I, I, my guess is that you know, oftentimes maybe the resolutions that we uh, we set are the same way. I wanna, I wanna look a certain way so people will like me. I want these sorts of things. I, I often, um, you know, uh, uh, I, I guess what is the mm. most the number one resolution probably revolves around weight. Am I wrong? Uh, I would guess that. I'm not. I'm yeah. not really sure. I haven't looked at yeah. the numbers on that, but that sounds like the one popular, mm -hmm. most popular probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine is uh, to have fewer cheap massages at bus stations. Ooh, that uh, that got a that got a noise out of Dr. Hackett over there when you said that. I don't don't know if I need to follow up on that. Well, also here's this thing. I mean, why the first of the year? It's almost a tradition that we do this, and it becomes kind of a simple thing, something we don't really. Um, spend time with and we don't follow through with so if it's something meaningful important to us we probably should do that throughout the year it doesn't matter about it so what i'm saying is okay we've we've set aside this moment where there was the resolutions it's almost like we check the box at the beginning of the year not it, really doing anything different and so in some ways that becomes a defensive maneuver it's a way of kicking the can it's a way of of not having to face the moment you're in and even the way I put that makes it sound like to have to face the moment is somehow, and there certainly may be a point of suffering in that. Right. But there also may not be. The goal would be, I think, it, at least implicit in what you said, that in a way, every breath is the potential for a resolution. That our capacity to have a lived moment, to be alive in the moment we're in, that's the challenge. How do, how do I accept this? You mm -hmm. know, Nietzsche has this, uh, he was really uh, against... He broad brushed Christianity, but I think he was really speaking about specific elements of Christianity. He said it was a, it's a cult of death, hmm. it's a cult of no, and for him hmm. it was, our goal is to cultivate yes, to be able to. He had this thought experiment that if you know that if, uh, if time was infinite and space and it was infinite, then that means everything you do is going to echo for infinity. Right. Every funyun you eat is going to be go. you're going to be eating that same funyun for for infinity, and the goal would be. Live as if you can say yes to that. I am glad that this is forever and that this will be done forever. 
How can you say yes in a way that is open to life in that way? And that so much of what we do is a no. You know? And like that becomes tricky. Let's say that you, mm-hmm. you're being mugged and four guys are stepping on your face. Right. How do you say yes to that moment? No. But Nietzsche would say the challenge is yes. You find a way to say this, you know, as you were losing consciousness to be able to say thank you to some degree that you were alive and present to be able to be in that moment. So Okay. Well, um, I understood up to that point. Uh, that was a bit of a, a little bit of a stretch on that, but I, I did understand. Didn't involve understand funyuns, it. though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were stealing his funyuns. Is that where we're going? Um, all right. So yeah. So there's going to be some suffering. There's going to be some insight and self awareness and uh, really taking inventory on some things when you make these. I don't know things you're not going to follow through. I could change the name of it, but resolutions. So The goal may not be necessarily awareness in terms of like an intellectual insight, but it may be the capacity for reflection and the capacity to be able to observe and be a participant in the things around you to some degree. If you look at some of the research and attachment theory, folks who have a secure attachment style are much more apt to be present with themselves and their partners as they move throughout the day. Okay. They are less likely to get lost in the relationship or the relational moment they're in. And so, um, like when you said that the um, uh, couple that you'd worked with, who mm. uh, the insight they had, well, they may have had an intellectual awareness, but they probably didn't have the reflective elements. Okay. Right? Does that make sense? It's like, for instance, I would imagine that as, as their patterns unfold, they might be able to name them. They might even be able to name them as are happening, but certainly as as a, after they've immediately occurred. But the goal is how can they be present with that information in that moment? And right. you know uh, what's the George Clinton saying? Free your uh, your your butt and your mind will follow. If um, it may require a behavioral action before the mind catches up with that, and the capacity of reflection is there. But and right. probably what we would say from an attachment theory perspective is. The act of beginning to go through the motions of having a secure attachment helped put in place something that could begin to get them to be secure with each other in these moments that they were where there was prior conflict. But right, and it, it sounded like that example too. There, there was an ongoing uh, conflict for a long time, and it just kind of <coughs> continued. It became the the status for them, uh, and so something to sort of uh, connect the two, the inside. Which as an aside, ways. there was. I don't know if you watch. If there's a, this thing called Slate. Slate.com, you ever mm-hmm. go on that thing? Mm-hmm. And they have an advice column. And one of the yeah, I, one of the advice was, help, my husband gets angry when I eat cheese. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> okay. my first off thought was, I'd like to have those sorts of marital problems. Wouldn't it be great? Yeah, if, that's cheese you're conflict, eating. <laughs> it was cheese. <laughs> well, on, on the other hand, what kind of cheese? <laughs> some of those French cheeses over there we made. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, problems of different levels, I guess. In, in that, in yeah, that and regard. I'll tell you, some cheese I won't eat because they're not excellent. If they're just Gouda, it's not good enough. <laughs> but boom! See, that's uh, we we've talked about having a trap set over in the corner so somebody can do the rim shot. And the but uh, no, I appreciate that uh, taking us off course like that. All right, so the notion then is what what do we, what should we do? Well, you, you think about uh, the idea of you know, the, the, the um, our existential brothers and sisters. They talk about the centrality of uh, the, the, the centrality of death, so that there is this notion that all of this is about to end, and that every moment, if it's it, truly a moment, has a beginning and an end, and it's our capacity to be present as it as it becomes a moment and as it fades away, and there is that sense of awareness and reflection. So, how do we stay present with that? The individual who wants to stop, uh, my wife who actually doesn't but if she did have a problem with smokeless tobacco right the goal would be is at those moments that she feels the urge for said thing it's not enough to just not do it it may require to think a little bit about again what scratch itch does it scratch what is it about the balance of my life at present that would make this a thing that i'd want to do Mm -hmm. it may be in the act of grabbing you know the skull can you're actually in a nietzschean sense saying no you were finding a way to escape there's a capacity for some higher investment, a capacity to be in some ways that you're refusing. Mm-hmm. And so the skull takes you in that direction. Right. Now, it's interesting because, and advocates of use of tobacco and drugs could say, maybe rightfully so, that in moderation, those things can be 
just like popular music. You okay. should be able to occasionally enjoy some little Zan if you want, right? Libations, yes. Yes. Well, what's the word? Like, what did you say? Oh, li- li- libations. Yes. The libations, yes. It, I wasn't going to say anything, but I think you and Hackett had been drinking a little heavy <laughs> when I got here. Could be That's, the pile of wine bottles in the corner. <laughs> it, oh, um, I don't know. We're not going to follow through on that, but we need to clean up or, those or bottles the fact over when there I, when I next came time. In, or the fact when I came in, you were giving each other tattoos. I was uh, like, this That is didn't not, happen. <laughs> but That's not. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah, uh, but but it also connects. In some ways, um, what I was here saying was the notion of addiction, mm-hmm. that people get addicted to drugs or addicted to these whatever it might be um and, and it becomes you know again when you think of it again this is all cycling crap in psychoanalytic <laughs> thought there's no such thing as an addiction there's a compulsion there may be a physiological hook that occurs somewhere in the course of becoming uh a, while you are engaging in a compulsive act but even there there is something that pulls you in a certain direction Right. And your capacity to slow that down enough, you may be able to give yourself the option of other things if you're present in that moment, if you have an affective yeah. connection. As an aside, we brought up this whole existential stuff. I've, yeah. I've often thought about how I might want to die. Okay. And you know what? I'd like to die like my grandfather. Oh. In his sleep. Because that's a great way to go. Not and, and nothing like the four other people in the car with him screaming. Oh. Because that's not... <laughs> oh. You know, I I, 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 I get pulled I, in, and I, it's I've not my fault. I, I I've done this enough. I should not get pulled into these things. But I, I've been saving reason, that one. Like, yeah, I, at least it didn't involve a wheelchair that we talked about earlier. So yeah, then don't bring that one back up. Thanks yeah, very much. But uh, so, all right. Well, I think um, I think though there's something useful about this notion of resolution or making some goals for yourself. Shouldn't we be making goals? I mean, set some things out there for mm. 2020. This is the year Look. we're in. The start of a decade. Come on. Hitler made goals. Look where that got us. Oh. <laughs> Did you have Am to? I wrong? Am Did I you? wrong? No, no. Yeah. There, there's, yeah. there's nothing wrong with, with, with goals. I think we should have them. I think okay. my concern would be is, <laughs> is that how do we um, – it is possible that by setting a goal – by uh, by setting parameters around uh, and, and generate a certain level of expectations, it can keep us from the moment we're in, and okay. it can also All set right. us up for failure. And so the goal may be if if you want to set a goal, maybe the goal is to um, to it to be more present. Um, uh, I got one of them. Uh, well, you got one of them the smartphones. I got one yeah. of them smart. It's, you know, yeah. you, so like um, everybody. Uh, whenever I go to the other day, I was going to get my hair cut, and so. Um, I go in and sit down, and the first thing I always do whenever I'm in a waiting room, haircut, um, um, manipedi. Get a lot of those manipedis? Um, I'm supposed to, but I haven't been there yet, but go okay, ahead. Okay, so manipedis. Or um, um, body hair sculpting. I get a lot of that, too. Nope. <laughs> I, I have a chest hair topiist. I don't know if you've ever, uh, but, uh, so, uh, yeah. all right. That's a heck of a job. I don't want to see that. I really <laughs> don't want to see that. But it's, did you take your shirt off or are you holding a Chia pet? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Quite but, all right. uh, um, in those moments, I used to always distract myself with the phone. Now what I do is I make it a point to sit there and try to – and you could do a few things. You, you could – in a moment that you're in, you could try to name five things that you hear, right? Okay. So listen for five things. Right. You could um, – you could um, um, uh, you could do through all senses. It might be difficult with smell because you may not want that. Three things you smell, but you could. You could. Yeah. Uh, the texture of the chair. You could literally. These are all centering ways to be present in the moment you're in. Right. You can literally, and I right. often start with this notion of the five things I might see, to be able to look around the room, to orient okay. yourself to the present. That's a way to be, you know, if you want to set a goal okay. or a resolution. How about think of ways to be present? Think of think of the ways in which you often pull yourself out of a moment. How can you be in this moment in some way that that could be? A- I'm kind of I, I kind of like that. I, I like the idea because it fits with a lot of things that we've been talking about over the last number of uh, episodes of this Scott therapy. And uh, so the idea of being present, being in the moment, <clears throat> uh, the Gestalt people talked about that. Um, uh, Losers. Well, well, the notion of <laughs> yeah, so being uh, using the sensory uh, inputs to identify what are you. Mm. It's about presence. So, what are you hearing? 
What do you see? Those kind of things. Have, you know, this is a, unlike the general population, one in ten gestaltists are frauders. Just a. Okay. But the question of <laughs> what are you aware of now uh, can help you kind of get back into that. It can help you to be there. present. Yeah. And, you know, and that goes back to Nietzsche, this notion of saying yes. It goes back to the idea of a lived moment. Uh, it's certainly not something you can do all the time. There are moments when it be, would be good to be in a place of dissociation or disavow. If you're being, um, you know, uh, tortured, present may not be the best thing to be. No. Uh, if you're in a moment of being irritation, leaning into the irritation, being able to name it for what it is, may give you the capacity to do something with it. Right. Um, so there, there is a dip into the moment, and then okay, you know, this is long. Right. And boring. It might be. It just might be too much to be in the moment all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you need a little vacation from the moment. Not for me. Not for you. You're okay. always in that moment. Yeah, well, no, I, got I, I am the moment. You are. You're making the moment as as we uh, as we speak. All right. Well, that's good information. So let me ask the final question, though. Do you have resolutions for this coming year, decade? What do you got? I'm curious. Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> I decided I'm going to get some neck tattoos. And uh, tattoos. So, okay, uh, yes. and but I want them also to be misspelled. I want uh, things. No uh, regrets. Is yeah, the famous commercial. Yeah. That's, that'd yeah, be that's one that I might want. <laughs> Do I have any resolutions? Let's see. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, you know, I. Uh, I resolve to be more stoic. No. Oh, okay. Said, uh, yeah. <laughs> said, uh, Is yeah. that possible? With the question, go boom. <laughs> Is uh, that not? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I've, I've never. I've never really thought about resolutions in that way. Um, I can certainly, let me think, there, there is something I, I made it a point, um, I'll tell you, this is going to sound weird, this is going to be a, oh, it won't be the I'm, first time, but go. <laughs> so, I'm often so restrictive with, uh, with, um, w- w- what is the term when you're over-focused on, on food, what's the term, uh, I'm escaping it. Uh, excessive, uh, um, uh, uh, you're, um, uh, I'll think of it. Okay. But, um, I almost had it, but, um. So, I've made it a point, I, I, this a few months ago, I had my wife start buying Reese's Minis. Yes. And after dinner, every day, I have two tiny Reese's Minis. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, All right. I say to myself, I'm going to give myself a little of this. So, yeah. my resolution was to have a little more enjoyment with some pop culture version of food. The okay. little Zan... <laughs> Of uh, of food, so okay, all right, man, yeah, uh, two, only two, all right, Good there two. we go. Well, um, I, I'm not really sure how to follow that up, other than to say good luck with that. Um, but, uh, and uh, it's interesting. I want to go back and listen to this episode. We said a lot of things. I'm not sure where we went. And we lost things, Hackett. But, he just disappeared. But, uh, yeah, we lost our executive producer. He got uh, fed up, and uh, he actually yeah, he, uh, just walked out. He stormed uh, so out of here. He stormed. Was, that was a quiet was, storm, but he stormed. He was. He was stormed. All right, my friend. It's good to talk to you. I hope you have a good week coming up, and um, I'll see you next time.